Thank you to all of the organizers. This has been really awesome. And uh, thank you to, to the audience. Yeah, I know you guys have been a really great audience. This can be kind of intimidating to be up here. So thanks to you first. Um, so I want to talk about Ruby at GitHub. Uh, I am Brandon Keepers, Beekeepers Online. You know, with a last name like Keepers, people like to think that they're funny and make jokes, like, ha ha, you're a keeper. Um, <laughs> I naively chose my first initial and last name as my screen name, so beekeepers. People are like, oh, do you keep bees? Let me clarify that. I do not, in case there was any confusion. I, feel, I wonder if I should, though. Like, we were joking yesterday at lunch, like, people whose names are like, ironic with what they do. You know, it's like, I think somebody mentioned there was a dentist like, named Dr. Payne, or, or like a urologist, I think, was named Dr. Chop or something like that. Which, anyway, all right, enough about that. <laughs> um, uh, so a little bit about me, besides my name, uh, I started, or I was co-founder of a consulting company called Collective Idea. I uh, was there for about five years. Uh, joined Ordered List, who, uh, where we built a couple products that you may have heard of or used. Uh, Gages is a web analytics app, and then SpeakerDeck.com, which I know a lot of the, the presenters here have posted their slides to. Uh, in late 2011, we had the opportunity to join with GitHub, our entire team. Um, so we were thrilled to do that. Uh, and so we've been at GitHub for about a year and a half now. Uh, I spend, I've, I've worked on a few things at GitHub, but lately I spend most of my time working on Speaker Deck. We have a whole team of people working on it now and um, some pretty exciting things to come. So I think it's probably no secret that GitHub loves Ruby. Uh, our founders were very active in the Ruby community early on. Um, we've been at a lot of conferences. Uh, and you know, GitHub being somewhat admired, uh, especially in this community, people then often have a lot of questions. So I thought it would be fun to just uh, do a talk kind of addressing some of those, uh, and then also give you guys a chance, a little bit of extended time for, for any questions that you have. So here's the ones I'm going to start with. Uh, which languages are used at, at GitHub? Uh, we'll, we'll look at some of the, our projects um, and stats across those. Where is Ruby not used? Why Ruby for everything else? Which libraries do we use? And then how do we handle updates? So both you know, releasing new features, how do we handle upgrades to Ruby and to Rails? So which languages are used at GitHub? Uh, I cloned all of the repositories on our GitHub organization, so github.com slash github. We have 602 repositories uh, that in some form or another um, are used internally. Uh, as I was looking at those, 228 of them were inactive, meaning they hadn't had a commit in six months. So I just kind of figured, well, if, if we're not maintaining them, they're probably not a core part of our infrastructure. So I ignored those. 42 projects were forks of like open source projects, uh, and so I didn't really include those. And then seven I just ignored because they kind of were skewing the stats and didn't really seem relevant. Like there was a bunch of like Cisco router configs, which were showing up as some language called Racket, which I have no idea even what that is. So anyway, so I ignored a bunch of those. Um, and then I also didn't try and chase down like all, you know, GitHub uses a lot of open source software. We contribute to a lot of open source software. So I didn't try and chase down like where are, are all the libraries that we use. Uh, these, these specifically, libgit2 um, is an effort we're helping out with to rewrite git as a linkable C library, so that's not included. Um, Boxin, which was talked about at Dev Day, play is our, our media center thing, and then you know, a lot of our employees have um, open source projects that, that we use at GitHub, so I didn't include those. So that being said, uh, here's the language breakdown by primary language of all of our internal repos. So two-thirds of them almost are Ruby. A uh, lot of JavaScript, some Objective-C, Shell, CoffeeScript, C, C-sharp, and then other. Um, and the other was like 20 or 30 other languages. Um, and those might have been you know, maybe a few libraries that were vendored or something like that. Um, the one that was surprising to me on this was that Java didn't show up. Um, and so, and I know like we have a couple Android apps, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So I started digging around a little bit more, and, and this I felt was a little bit misleading because it's by primary language. Um, and I, we all know that often you have a repository with multiple languages in it. So I decided to compare then by bytes. 
Um, I, I wasn't sure if that would be the best metric, but I, I thought it was an interesting one. And the story changes quite a bit. Um, now we only have a third of our code is Ruby, 15% C, JavaScript, Objective-C, CoffeeScript, C Sharp, Puppet. Now Java enters the picture, and then still 6% of other. So I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like We could take some guesses about what that means. So we have a lot less Ruby if we compare by bytes. Um, maybe it's because Ruby is more expressive and concise. Um, it may just be because we have a lot of Ruby projects that don't have a lot of code in them, but we have you know, only a few Objective-C projects that also have a lot of code. It might just mean that some of these languages are not as expressive as Ruby, kind of the inverse of that. So like C doesn't really give you anything for free. Um, you, know, you have to do everything yourself. So I thought those were kind of interesting. I think the story, though, that this tells, and, and something that uh, is, is best summed up by Ryan Tomeko, um, one of our developers, is at GitHub, we really don't see ourselves as a Rails shop. I know a lot of the community does. You know, we don't even see ourselves as a Ruby shop. If we have in any um, identity tied to a technology, I think it's Unix, um, both in, in the way that we build tools and really our culture. Like We're all about finding all of these small pieces that do one thing and do them well and combining them together. So while we love Rails and Ruby, I think Unix is really where our, um, our identity is. And, and just kind of a, like a side note of that, like going on the Unix analogy, I mean, one of the cool things about GitHub is that pretty much everybody in the company also has sudo access, you know, kind of metaphorically. Um, you know, we all have complete autonomy, and you know, if I want to push hard for something, I can. It's just a matter of convincing my coworkers. So those are the languages we use. Let's look at where Ruby is not used. The biggest category of these uh, are, are native. Um, so we have GitHub for Mac, which is the Git GUI, uh, written in Objective-C, as most Mac apps are. We have GitHub for Windows, again, the Windows GUI, written in C-sharp, as, as most Windows apps are. We have a couple Android apps. So for GitHub, we have... Um, you know, just the generic GitHub app, and then Gages, the web analytics, we also have an Android app. Uh, so, like, if you think back to the, the pie chart that only showed 2% of our code being Java, I, I think one of, like, one of my hunches about why that's so small is both of our, our uh, Android apps are open source. Um, and so, uh, Kevin Swicky, who works on those, is really intentional about pulling out the pieces that are reusable into open source libraries or contributing back to existing ones. So the, the GitHub for Android apps really aren't that large um, since they're, you know, they're reusing so much code. We have numerous iOS apps, a couple public ones in the App Store, and then we also have a bunch of internal ones um, for staff use. And then uh, Hubot, which was talked about at, at uh, the DevOps Day by Jesse. Um, Hubot is all written in CoffeeScript and runs on Node. So all of you Node haters, take that. Woo. Woo. There's a good use for Node, chatbot. <coughs> There's better uses for Node. I'm not implying anything. Anyway, whatever. Uh, we, have, we have a bunch of Unix utilities, so like some tooling around Git and all of the things that Git does. Um, and those are all mostly written in C, you know, a lot of shell scripts, stuff like that. So looking at those, one of the, the questions people then ask next is, well, what about like PhoneGap or one of these other like wrapper frameworks that let you build native apps or mobile apps in not the native language? I think there's, there's a couple of reasons why we don't use any of these. Um, none of them really intentional. Uh, first, I think that we, we tend to hire people that already have experience in the thing that we're hiring them to do. And so when we hire somebody to work on you know, an iPhone app, they're people that have typically already been working on iPhone apps and, and thus part of the Objective-C community. Um, and the other part, I mean, I don't, this isn't really official, but it's, I've never seen a PhoneGap app that felt like a real native app. Um, or at least, if you, if you have one, please show me, because I just think it's a lot harder to, to create the experience you want using these frameworks. Um, or put another way, you know, when you visit France, you can probably get by speaking English, but it'll, it'll be obvious that you're not French. Um, you know, there's just something about that native component that is important. So then people will also say, well, you know, what about Ruby Motion? Because that compiles down to LLVM. It's the same as Objective-C. 
And again, I think it's the same reason. Like, you know, we're not, we're not hiring people that we're doing Ruby development and asking them to work on, on iOS. Um, we're hiring people that are already doing that. And then as for me personally, who has a Ruby background, the reason I don't, I'm not so interested in Ruby motion is uh, this scientific graph. In my mind, Objective-C is not that hard. It's learning everything else. I mean, it's the conventions, it's the user interface guidelines, it's learning the iOS APIs. These numbers are totally made up, so. <laughs> All right, so why Ruby for the rest? Uh, we don't get this question so much at Ruby conferences, but we do at you know, Python and other areas. Uh, I, it was, I don't know if it was ever really an intentional decision. Um, you know, the, the founders of GitHub started using Ruby and thus attracted people that were using Ruby. Um, it's not really an official policy. Like, we don't say, okay, well, if we're going to write a, a web service, let's, let's write it in Ruby. Um, one of the core tenets of, of GitHub is this concept of no parents. And, you know, what we mean by that is two things. One, like, nobody's going to tell us what to do. You know, when you, when you show up at GitHub, you make your own decisions. But as a result of that, you also have to live with the consequences of those decisions. So, like, I could go write a, a core piece of GitHub in Go or Scala, but then I'm responsible now for maintaining that and making sure that, that it's stable and, you know, that there's no issues with it. So, again, you know, every, we're open to using whatever. Um, thus, you know, we have kind of a, a smattering of languages, but there's also some responsibility that comes with that. So if you were to ask me personally, why do I use Ruby? Um, I think that's actually kind of a hard question to answer. Uh, it's like asking me, like, why do I drive a Toyota? So my wife and I just went and bought a new car recently to replace our old Toyota Camry, and we drove, like, one of everything. Um, it felt like, anyway. And at the end of the day, like, we ended up buying another Toyota. Not really intentionally, that was just the one that we liked the best. And I could probably come up with all of these reasons why I, you know, why I like Toyotas. You know, they're reliable, dependable, all of those things. Um, just like I come up with reasons why I prefer Ruby. But I feel like at the end of the day, it really just comes down to taste. Like I tried uh, Python before I learned Ruby, and it, it really didn't stick for some reason. Not that there's anything wrong with it, I just, I just didn't prefer it. And it also is about practicality. Um, you know, if I'm going to invest 10,000 hours or four hours a day in learning something, um, I want to learn something that has a, a pretty wide range of uses. Uh, and Ruby's one of those things. So, like, you know, Ruby, Ruby's not a dump truck. It's not, it's not the internet. It's a series of tubes. Sorry. Anyway, it's, it's not this specialized piece of machinery that is, is only used for one thing. Um, you know, or it's not a semi. It's not a, you know, a motorcycle that can go really fast. It's, it's probably a little bit more practical, like a, a little pickup or a sedan. Um, and so that's why I prefer it. I can use it for scripting. I can use it for the web. Um, if I wanted to, I could use it for native apps, um, if, if only to play around. So there, that's why Ruby. What libraries do we use is another question. Uh, this was a fun one to look at. So we had 153 repositories with a gem file in them, which, you know, as we know, is the, the standard way to declare your dependencies. And so I, I parsed through those and just kind of added up what, what gems do we declare dependencies on. Now, I didn't look at the gem file.lock, which shows all of the, the actual dependencies. Um, I, I was only looking at the declared ones. And I struggled to find a way to visualize this. So you get a really big, you know, like straight out of 2001 uh, word cloud. So we'll, we'll walk through this a little bit. Uh, I'll give you a minute to stare at it. So obviously, the, the bigger the word, the more it's used in our projects. So just to draw your attention to a few of them, um, right here in the middle, you know, the two main app frameworks, Sinatra and Rails. I'll talk more about those in a second. If we want to look at databases, uh, we've got Redis, Postgres, MySQL. Uh, SQLite 3, um, I have no idea why that's showing up. I need to look. I, my guess is those are probably like prototype apps or, or something we were just playing around with. And I, I hope to God they're not actually used in production anywhere. <laughs> but. And then I don't know if you can see them, but there's two really small, uh, React Client and Mongo. We have a couple apps that, that do use those. Um, interestingly, MySQL is, is the one that our ops team has kind of chosen to officially support, just simply for like 
you know, their sanity and bandwidth of, of staying alive. Um, but I found it interesting that we use Postgres in more apps. Um, we have a lot of stuff deployed on Heroku, so that may be the reason, but I just thought that was an interesting observation. So we look at test frameworks. I'll talk a little bit more about these in a minute, but we've got a smattering of, of libraries for helping with testing. Uh, so RSpec and RSpec Rails. Again, I only looked at the declared dependencies, so some you know, had a, a declared dependency of RSpec, some had an RSpec Rails. A little bit of mini-test. Um, test unit doesn't show up because it's a, um, in the standard library. And then lots of other things for help, you know, mocking, web mock, rack test, some poltergeist, and capybara. So there's all of them again. So the big question then is, well, Sinatra or Rails? Uh, I think at, at some conference, somebody at GitHub said that they don't like Rails, and so now everybody thinks everybody at GitHub hates Rails. Uh, the reality is we use both, and, and we use both of them a lot. Uh, we have 51 projects that use Sinatra. Uh, we have nine that use both in the same app, and 30 that, that just use Rails. Uh, the overlap there is we, we often, in a project, will make main parts of the app in Rails and then like specialize like API or something unique in Sinatra and then mount that as middleware in the Rails app. Um, so like that's how like the GitHub API works. Um, it's all in the same code base and we just mount the Sinatra app in. So I thought this was interesting um, and as I was looking at this, one of my hunches was that while we have a lot of projects that use Sinatra, I bet they're all pretty small. And so again, I compared by bytes um, and the picture turned to this. So in, in those projects, we have 12 megs of Ruby code that is Rails, uh, 10 megs of, of ones with Sinatra dependencies, and then eight megs in those projects that were shared. Um, so that tells you we've got you know, just over two megs of, of plain Sinatra apps, even though there's 51 of them. Um, so I it, you know, it looks like we tend to use Rails for, for larger apps. You know, as far as like, the, the kind of our opinion on Sinatra versus Rails, I think that you know, there probably are some people inside of GitHub that have strong opinions about it. Most of us are just a little more practical. Um, I think in some sense, most Sinatra apps just haven't gotten complex enough to be a Rails app yet, which is a good thing. Like, hopefully they don't get that complex, but. So test unit, RSpec, or mini tests. You know, this is one of those epic battles that you know, the fate of humanity depends on, like tabs versus spaces. Uh, <laughs> Again, I think we're pretty pragmatic about it. Uh, a lot of people at GitHub do really prefer a plain old test unit, and that's fine. Um, a lot of people really prefer RSpec, that's fine. A few people prefer mini-spec. I really wish the test unit crowd, would, or mini-test, excuse me, I really wish the test unit crowd would just move to mini-test, because um, it's so much better. But, <laughs> yeah. Ryan, woo, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. All right, so how do we handle updates? The biggest thing is rolling out new features. Uh, at GitHub, we're constantly deploying, uh, and, and we rarely will have a feature that is worked on for weeks or months without being deployed. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll work on these features and get them to a state where we can actually merge them back into master and deploy them with them turned off. And the, w the way that we do that is with these feature flags. So what we'll do is we'll define a bunch of helper methods uh, of for whether the current user can see this new feature or not. And so we'll, we'll often have a module like called feature flags or something like that that just says, does this user get preview features? And usually defaults to, well, are they you know, like a GitHub employee or whatever, whatever the app, uh, whoever the target is for that app. And then as we add, start to add new features, we'll add new methods, new flags for them. So in this example, we're making a, a theoretical time travel feature. You know, it's a very advanced feature. Uh, so I just say, OK, is time travel enabled? Well, the result is, does this user have preview features? We then mix that into the model. Um, so the model is responsible for determining, like, are they staff? And then in the controller, we take all of those methods and we delegate them to whoever the current user is and then declare them as helper methods. So now, in all of our controller's views and, you know, and then in our user model, we have whether this user is allowed to see whatever this feature is. So when we go to implement it, um, whoops, jumping ahead. So we'll go into the view and we'll say, okay, 
I'm adding this new feature. If time travel is enabled for this, this user, show it on the page. You know, there might be an else block that says, OK, if it's not, do the old thing. Um, and then in the controller, we'll restrict access to it and say, you know, don't allow them to, to run any of these actions unless they have this feature. So I mean, this is really important for us because it allows us to get code out as soon as possible and avoid long-lived branches. Um, like one of the features I worked on was the new notification stuff that went out like six months ago. And that was like a six-month project. And if I had kept that as a separate branch and never deployed it, it would have been really painful. Um, but about three months in, we got to a point where we're like, all right, staff are going to start using these new notifications. Um, so for us, you know, like github.com looks very different than it does for you. Um, but we started using them, and it was really painful. Like, we found all the spots where they didn't work, um, but it allowed us to, to iterate on that and be able to test whether there were any performance issues or any, any problems with them. So then when launch day finally comes, uh, all we do is we go back to our, our feature flags module, and we replace uh, the conditional in, in time travel enabled with just true. And we commit it and we deploy it. And so that's how we release the new feature. Uh, if you haven't done anything like this, I highly recommend trying it. Um, it's really awesome. The having to commit code to, to release a, the feature might not feel great to you. Um, and there's a couple libraries out there which I highly recommend checking out as well, Flipper and Rollout. Um, and they just allow you to do that dynamically. You can, start, you can say, OK, I want to roll out features to 10% of my users. Or you could define groups, like you could have an early access group and allow people to opt into that. And then, and then they can see those new features. So. Migrating to Ruby 1.9, or now 2.0, um, has been quite an interesting challenge. It was, uh, you know, people knew for a long time that, that GitHub was still on uh, Ruby 1.8 and uh, Rails 2, which I'll talk more about in a second. So the path to 1.9 uh, was, was pretty long. I think it took us about six months. Um, but the first step was simply running continuous integration, our tests against both Ruby 1.8 and 1.9. So every time we'd commit and deploy, the test would run against both of them. And obviously, right away, like, all the tests failed. Like, I don't even think like, Bootstrap finished, because we had like, dependencies on like, System Timer or some, some other gem that was 1.8 only. Um, and then at some point, like, some magic happened, and now we're on 1.9. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turned out uh, step two was actually TMM1. Uh, Man Gupta is a hero at GitHub. Um, seriously, one of the smartest people I think I've ever met. Um, but he spent a lot of time working on this. And what he would do was, you know, run the test. We'd run the test against both. He'd look at the test output, figure out what was causing the test to not run, and he would fix it. So, like, system timer gem doesn't work. So in your gem file, you say, okay, only for Ruby 1.8, include this gem. You fix that, you deploy it. And the important part was he was constantly merging that stuff back into master. So we got our test running against Ruby 1.8 and 1.9, um, got them to a point where, the, where they were both green, simply by doing that one thing at a time. Um, but it's important, I mean, it, it, since he spent six months on it, it would have been a disaster if he had done that in a separate branch and kept trying to keep it merged you know, and up to date. Um, so he just did it one, one, one thing at a time, uh, making fewer and fewer tests fail. So in the path to Ruby 2.0 is the same. Run CI against all three versions. Um, and we were for a while because uh, GitHub Enterprise was still on 1.8. Uh, they, they just finally are now making, uh, we're finally making the transition to 1.9 on, on uh, GitHub Enterprise. But we have uh, GitHub.com and, and uh, a couple other projects that are already green on Ruby 2.0 using the same method. So, and the, I mean, the nice thing about this is that for the most part, Ruby 2.0 and Ruby 1.9 are, are somewhat backward compatible with, with 1.8, um, which allows us to make our test pass with all three versions. So we saw some performance gains by switching to 1.9. Um, you know, the, the average CPU response time went down by 25, 25 milliseconds. Uh, for people that like graphs, it looked like this. Um, there's a little, you can see where we, we deployed 1.9, there's where's the dip, and then it goes right back up. We actually hit a GC bug in Ruby 1.9, and Amon had to you know, patch that and sub submit it upstream. Um, so we got, we got some good performance gains out of it. So Rails 3 is a bit of a challenge. Um, GitHub.com is still on Rails 2.3. And unlike upgrading Ruby, we can't 
you know, it's not really possible to get your tests passing against both, right? Because they're declared to gem dependencies. Um, so we've had to take a, a similar but, but different approach to that. Um, we do have a Rails 3 branch. And what we've started doing is backporting some of the APIs. So we maintain, we maintain a fork of Rails, Rails 2.3. And in there, we've started to try and backport some of the Rails 3 APIs so that we can at least make our code compatible with both. Um, and where we can't pull it into Rails itself, we'll try and, and pull it into GitHub.com. So, so that backport's in progress. It's just really painful, like trying to pull back like Action Mailer API, the changes to Active Record, um, and make Rails 2 and Rails 3 look to be the same. And so at some point, that Rails 3 branch, which we're keeping up to date, up to date with Master, um, is pat will be passing, and then, then we can start to try and deploy it. Uh, the challenge, too, with deploying that to production is there's pretty significant performance uh, issues, well, not issues, but difference in performance with Rails 3. Um, so we couldn't just roll it out and say, you know, let's hope that it doesn't break. Um, so we're going to figure out how to roll it out slowly and see the performance side effects. So. That's all. I'm curious if you guys have any other questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.